Stanley Cohen died just over a month ago. A couple of days after his death, the London School of Economics, where he was Emeritus Professor of Sociology, set up a website to honour his achievements in the study of crime and deviance, prisons and social control, and human rights. Visitors to the site were invited to post their own tributes. Well, the response was immediate, and it was prolific. Here's just one example from the hundreds of contributions. A lot of academics do good stuff that is theoretical, political, engaged and relevant in both criminology and human rights, but to paraphrase Carly Simon, nobody did it better than Stan. Well, in this programme I'm going to be using different aspects of Stan's work and life to provide a sort of solid justification for those sorts of tributes. I'll be hearing views from distinguished senior academics and from researchers who are currently using his ideas to make sense of their own findings. My starting point is personal. When I began my own academic career at York University in the mid-60s, I was in charge of teaching a criminology course. It was a pretty, pretty dull assignment, a seemingly endless consideration of the causes of crime and delinquency. But all that was to change when I met up with Stan and he began to talk about a quite different approach to studying crime which was being developed then in the United States, the sociology of deviance. And the leading figure in that development was Howard Becker, the author of the classic undergraduate text, Outsiders. What are Howard's memories of Stan at that time? He was very interested in what I was doing, as you were and Jock Young. You all wanted us to come to London for the annual meeting of the British Sociological Association. In Britain, as in the United States, the field that's called criminology was very much in the hands of people who worked very closely with official agencies uh, like the police and the courts who had the monopoly on defining who was a bad guy and who wasn't. I think that what Stan had in mind was the very different emphasis that people like me had been doing, not studying the causes of crime, not taking as given that criminals were bad people and we had to find out why, but rather asking how does it come about that some people get to call other people bad, in this case criminal. And it was this new emphasis upon the labellers rather than the label which informed Stan's first book, Folk Devils and Moral Panics, published in 1972. In later years, he used to say that if he had a penny for every time the concept of moral panic had been misused, he'd have long ago been a millionaire. But there can also be no doubt about the importance, the fruitfulness, if you like, of the concept in sociology, about its, its capacity for drawing attention to the manner in which certain events, such as the episodic battles between the mods and rockers on the beaches of Brighton in the 60s, could be transformed by the media and by a range of moral entrepreneurs into a threat to core social values and interests. Well, I'm now joined on the line from Leicester by Karen Lumsden. Karen's a lecturer in sociology at Loughborough University, and she makes explicit use of this concept of moral panic in a new book called Boy Racer Culture, Youth, Masculinity and Deviance. Karen, I'm so sorry, I think trouble on the line prevented you from getting down to be in the studio with us, but thank you so much for going into the studio there. Can you begin by describing the group that you were studying, the so-called bully bashers, do I say it correctly, bully bashers yeah. of Aberdeen? Tell me about these people. Okay, um, well, the book is a study of a particular car subculture in Aberdeen, which um, has used a particular area of the city called the Beach Boulevard since the 1960s. So it was a study of the subculture, but also the moral panic um, in terms of the social reaction to um, their use of that particular urban space. So they gather there to show off their modified cars, to engage in various dangerous driving manoeuvres um, and socialise more generally. Mod modified in what way? I just, I've, I've seen some of these cars, yeah. but just tell me about a few of the modifications. So modified in terms of um, aesthetic modifications, so maybe quite colourful um, paint work, adding spoilers to the cars, lowering the suspension, um, loud exhausts, loud stereo systems, and also maybe um, mechanical modifications in terms of the engine. Now you say that, I mean, they use the word racers, but they aren't actually racing, are they, most of the time, these people? I mean, they're just on the boulevard, they're driving around. Yeah, I mean, it's a common misconception. Most of the time they're actually driving at quite slow speed, um, with the, the main aim being to show off and display their car um, and engage in a sort of form of um, celebrity. So um, 
there's a misconception with regards to how many of them actually partake in illegal street racing or or speeding as well. Now, one of the problems that sort of you, that you that that, that that happened when you were studying there was, I mean, it was really aroused by the fact that there was a going to be a new development nearby, wasn't it? And uh, as this new development came along, somehow these uh, these these cars, these these racers, so-called racers, were <laughs> being seen as more of a problem than they had been before. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the social reaction, it was the um, urban regeneration of that particular part of um, the city of Aberdeen, which influenced the the, the moral uh, contestation from local residents, um, police and the council um, about the, the boy racers use of the public road. So in a sense, they were seen as matter out of place. Um, and of course, at the same time, we get the development of the sort of the Asbos, don't we? So that really, even if these people had not been committing a crime before, they might well be indicted under that sort of legislation. Yeah, we see instances of how um, behaviours or ways they modified the car, which previously hadn't been seen as antisocial or perhaps problematic, now becomes um, a target of antisocial behaviour legislation. So noise from car exhausts and stereo systems um, and so on. So things which really weren't criminalised before or regarded can now be criminalised because we've got this general antisocial behaviour legislation. And um, the... Of course, as Stan would have um, predicted in his account of how moral panics arose, how something which really was not all that consequential becomes consequential, the media are going to play a key part. T tell me the part played by the media in Aberdeen. In terms of the moral panic um, with regards to Aberdeen's boy racers, it was very much a localised, uh, regional moral panic um, in terms of um, exaggeration um, about the actual problem that they, they posed, um, the behaviours that they were engaging in, um, and um, obviously portraying the, the views of the police and the residents. Um, and the boy racers do talk about how their voices were silenced um, by the media. Um, and they wanted presumably to constantly talk about these people who were just driving their, their, their cars up and down uh, as, as, as may, may turn them into illegal joy riders. That's right, yeah. We have um, instances where the, the behaviour or the culture itself is seen as, or there's hints to them perhaps engaging in other forms of criminal or deviant driving behaviours or other activities such as drug dealing and, and so on. Now, here are these people, many of whom, as you say, are doing nothing more than cruising around in their sort of redesigned, their modded cars. But what did the, the drivers themselves, how did the, the folk devils, really, in this story, how did they react to this boy racer label which people were trying to slap on them? And we have quite a strong reaction from them with them um, saying, um, you know, they claim we're boy racers, but we're not. In fact, we don't actually race. So the label itself doesn't actually apply. But it was interesting in that they didn't actually, um, even though they, they didn't, apply the label to themselves, they didn't reject it fully because they still could pick out individuals who they would say were the minority of the group who, um, again, gave them a bad name. So it was interesting how the label itself, um, they actually applied it to other people rather than just rejecting it outright. And what is the situation now? I mean, has the moral panic declined? Is there still a moral panic about this? What's going on? Um, it has, it seems to have declined, um, um, sort of, I think a lot of, in terms of the volatility um, and the moral panic about boy racers, it was linked to the use of antisocial behaviour legislation at that particular point in time um, when it came into force in 2004. So it has seemed to fade into the background, but we do see evidence of um, the same types of reactions to instances of illegal street racing and boy racers in other parts of the UK. Karen Lunsman, thank you very much. Thank you for telling us about a contemporary study which uses a moral panic. And let me just uh, say that your new book um, has just been recently uh, published and it's called Boy Racer Culture, Youth, Masculinity and Deviance. Thanks. Now, I asked another of um, Stan's uh, former colleagues, Stuart Hall, who was the one-time director of the Centre for Contemporary Cultural Studies at Birmingham University and formerly Professor of Sociology at the Open University, to summarise for me the, the political dimension of the moral panic concept. Moral panic comes out of, of course, the confrontation between mods and rockers in youth culture, which started to emerge at the seaside towns on the Saturday night or Friday night and attracted a lot of attention because of sensational kids struggling, fighting on the beaches. So there was a real event there to explain. But what moral panic helped us to see was that this was a really huge phenomenon. That as soon as this happened, you know, people homed in on it. It became a topic that everybody was talking about. It became symptomatic of everything else. The ills of the world were somehow being fought out, you know, being mods and rockers on <laughs> Brighton Beach people's anxieties and fears about the world changing and 
where were the days of the empire? <laughs> you know, on and on. So the thing gets both exaggerated and massively invested by these floating feelings, which is what a moral panic is. Everybody piles in, the churches, the moral guardians, the spokesmen, the newspaper correspondents, and finally, of course, the police, and behind them, the state, and behind them, the politicians. So all of a sudden, this what appears to be this tiny event is ramified out of all proportion. Stuart Hall. Anyone who reads a great deal of sociological research will recognise the role that, um, that accident can play in providing access to particular groups and subcultures. And it was just such an accident which lay behind the first book that I wrote with Stan. We'd both been invited to teach a sociology class to prisoners in Durham Jail, but it was only when we entered the prison that we realised our students were the notorious inmates housed in the maximum security wing, prisoners who were facing up to 25 years inside. Well, how, we asked each other after a teaching session in the wing, could anybody psychologically face up to such a project? Well, why don't we ask them, said Stan, and that was how our research began. Well, Stan Cohen was to go on to make other significant contributions to our understanding of prisons and penal policy. His book, Visions of Social Control, published in 1985, drew upon Michel Foucault's work to show how even with the most benign intentions, social control had begun to spread outside the prison gates. Well, my next guest has drawn extensively on Stan's work on prisons and social control. He's David Scott, who's a senior lecturer in criminology and criminal justice at the University of Central Lancashire. Uh, let me start, David, by asking you, I mean, how would you assess Stan's contribution to, well, prison research and criminology? Yeah, it's a great question, Laurie. And I guess the question is, what has Stan done for criminology? And the answer is so large and so broad, it would probably take the whole of this programme just to answer that. But <laughs> let me just give a few very brief points, because what Stan did was Stan, over the last four decades, has shaped the direction of criminology. Each one of his books, whether it be Moral Panics... In 1972, that introduced the notion of the sociology of deviance. His work as he went into visions of social control engaged with new aspects around criminal justice. And when we got into the 1990s and we started to see issues around state crime and crimes of the powerful, well, leading the way was states of denial. What he gave us, and what he gives us still today, was an agenda, a vocabulary, the questions that he asked, the analytical framework that he actually developed has shaped what has come around his work. He has influenced every single generation, and let's, he continues to influence. Well, let's have your influence on you specifically, because I mean, your your work. You've you've been looking at uh, a, a women's wing, a prisoners' wing. How how did Stan's <clears throat> ideas inform that research? Yes, well, this goes back to the work I did um, in Durham Prison, and following your work with Stan um, in 1971, the E Wing was closed, but it was reopened again in 1976 as Durham H Wing, which became known as a She Wing. And some 20 years later, I actually went and did some research in. Um, in, in She Wing. And what I drew upon um, in part my understanding and th what that book confirmed was the issues that were raised in psychological survival about the pains of incarceration. The book and the, the, the language that, that, that yourself and that Stan had given us mm. was about how meanings were shattered by prison, how time consciousness shaped the mundane realities of what prison life was like. And in the book they talk about living in the submarine, the prisoners talk about living in the submarine. And when I went into She Wing, which was uh, exceptionally uh, claustrophobic and intense, as you'd know yourself, mm. Laurie, from your time researching there also, and I remember walking in and such an abnormal environment, and there in the corner was a prison officer just dancing by herself as if she was dancing by, by, you know, dancing with ghosts. And this is where Stan's other work, State of Denial, comes in, because when you start to examine the relationship between prisoners and prison officers, what you're attracted to is the way in which the prison officers allow themselves, if you like, not to see some of the pains of imprisonment which are occurring around them. Yes, yes, I think that that's partly, I mean, one argument would be that, that 
and, and drawing upon states of denial and the vocabulary of the techniques of denial that uh, will be talked about a little bit later, you can see how there's an issue there for prison officers. Do they acknowledge the suffering that goes around? Because what psychological survival and states of denial collectively do is they highlight... First of all, this notion of the suffering that is, is in, insipid within the prison relationships and insipid within the structures of imprisonment, but also the danger of acknowledging that, that, that how do prison officers actually do their job? How do they survive in their kind of role? And how do they perceive the suffering of prisoners? So, so you're looking at techniques. 